Welcome back to Front Runner Podcast. Today we have Ryan on the show. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Great to be here, James. Ryan, when I think of the difference between services and products, there's a, a fundamental difference between the two. Services tend to be intangible. They tend to be ones in which we can't try in advance, although that's not always the case. We can think of services are things that we have performed on ourselves, services such as things that are done on our possessions, such as an automobile. We may also have services in terms of information or knowledge, such as a weather report. But that intangibility and that need or that lack of ability to try it in advance seems to distinguish it from products. Products, they're all standard. Everything is pretty much the same as the other product. And we can try one and know what the, what they're all about pretty easily in advance. There's issues between uh, services of supply and demand. With products, we can inventory a product to meet demand. Services with a service provider and a service receiver, it's not so much the case. And from a sales point of view, this must give some tricky issues. And if we go back to the traditional marketing model, we see in the sa in marketing, there's the, uh, what is it, the four or five Ps about marketing, place, promotion, price, product. Uh -huh. But with services, there are seven of those Ps because we have to have a couple of extra. Maybe based on your experience, you can give us a more of a distinctive difference or the issues around selling of services versus product. Yeah, for sure. And I guess to give you some context or to give the listeners some context, uh, you know, what Growth Genius does is, is basically um, help small businesses with the service of, you know, generating more leads or conversations with their ideal customers. And we started out purely as a service, leveraging a lot of third parties and have kind of shifted our model to working more with product and eventually selling a you know self-serve product that uh, you know we'd offer service on top of. So the way that we kind of distinguished uh, things as we started to make this switch was with respect to you know us essentially replacing a function that small sales teams were already doing themselves. So from that standpoint, we had that working in our favor. You know, small teams, you know, trying to sell, trying to create leads, understand that ideal, that process, that endpoint of, you know, getting somebody to respond back and um, saying that they're interested in chatting. Um, so what we were able to do is help them understand how to optimize that function that was already being performed. Uh, how I think that differs from, you know, where we're heading is that in terms of product, we're really building something new in the way that that function gets carried out and in the way that the workflow happens. So there's a lot more education that comes into play when we're trying to position selling a product. Uh, you know, a lot of resources go into, you know, free trials or adoption or demos or walkthroughs and all that kind of stuff because we're really shifting the way that work is being done and trying to, you know, move into the future and optimize uh, almost a revolution in the way that work is being done. Well, let's move into uh, um, the risk side of services. Given that intangibility of services and the lack of triability of services, there therefore suggests that there's a risk on the side of the customer of buying something that they can't experience until they buy it. And I'm wondering in the e-commerce kind of world that we're in, how do we address that risk side? You mentioned it briefly, maybe we could have warranties or, or things like that. But from the salesperson's point of view, how does that change the sales process to have to have um, have to directly address risk on the customer side? Yeah, that's an amazing question and something that we struggle with every day. And I think we're, we're making strides. But the way that I think about it and the way that, you know, our team is built is, you know, trying to create as much uh, clout, if you want to call it that, uh, around your organization and the service that you're offering, offering. And that would mean things like, you know, case studies, webinars, content, references that they can connect with off of line, and a website or, you know, a storefront that illustrates the value in a way that is, um, you know, extremely friendly and helpful. Uh, you know, you're right. There is a lot of intangibility and, you know, we often close a deal or, you know, a contract gets signed and there's this visceral 
dopamine feeling that customers expect that we often can't provide. So what we have to do is offer an amazing experience and an, uh, an amazing ability for them to, to, to experience the team and the welcoming and the onboarding and all of the relationships that are going to be built and all of the expectations that they can derive as soon as possible. So we're really focused on the bottom of the funnel and the, the, the top of the customer success experience blending into one seamless, enjoyable experience for the customer to try and bridge that, that fear and trust gap as much as possible. Part of that fear and trust, there's, there's two other attributes that are in there as well. And that is expectations and perceptions, expectations being prior to a sale and perceptions being after. And those two are the major components in how customers evaluate a service. Because in a product, we can evaluate a product, we can drop it, kick it over, figure out how long and its durability. But with services, it's more so on the customer experience, as you said, and that customer experience is largely derived from expectations and then perceptions. So in the sales experience or the, the methodology that you're familiar with, how do you manage expectations and perceptions? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, we've definitely been victims of over-promising and under-delivering early on uh, as a company in trying to get those first few customers. Um, but as you start to you know move down your life cycle as a business, you start to realize the consequences that that you know uh, presents longer term. Um, so as you grow and as you continue to learn and see customers do well and see customers fail, um, it's important to you know set expectations that are real that I think are mindful of the teammates that you have. So as a salesperson, I can promise the world, but in services, it's extremely difficult to do that over and over again, because I'm sitting next to my customer success team that has to deal with that reality and has to deliver on uh, on the promises that I've made. So if I want to build a strong relationship with my team and build a cohesive unit that's working in tandem and in unison, I have to be mindful of what we are capable of. And I think honesty with the customer and an underst having them understand that their expectations may be unrealistic and that we're still able to offer a great service and being able to explain what those realities are in a more interesting and, um, I guess, positive, positive, positive way or a different position um, can, can kind of help bridge that gap. Ryan, it, it seems like you're really talking about um, an ongoing relationship with a customer in which you establish it and maintain it over time. What about mm -hmm. those sites in which there isn't that relationship? Maybe it's a very big company with very many customers, maybe customer only buys infrequently or one of, or maybe it's a commodity product, which really isn't, uh, sorry, not a commodity product, commodity service, which isn't really distinguishable. For example, insurance is uh, maybe apples to oranges comparison on insurance policies, but people can pretty much figure that out on their own. So for those sites or those organizations selling a service in which you don't have the opportunity to have that ongoing relationship. Do you have any advice on the sales side on how to how to still make that connection with the customer? Yeah, for sure. And I think um, 10 years ago, the answer would have been very difficult and very challenging, but in a world of marketing automation and uh, automated email campaigns and retargeting and remarketing, uh, it's never been easier to, to kind of, you know, capture that or, or solve that problem. Um, I think, you know, getting really good at mastering your market automation tool, whether it's HubSpot or Pardot or, um, you know, a tool of that nature like Marketo, um, being able to leverage that and give the feedback or insights of what the customers are doing to the salespeople when they, so what that when they do engage, they have context is probably the way that I would design that structure if you know, I was leading an organization um, with that challenge set presented to itself. Those insights and the way you're deriving that, can you speak a little bit more about that in terms of are you using some kind of business intelligence, AI, um, traditional data analytics based on statistical processes? How are you deriving those insights or is it more intuitive? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's take an example of uh, you know a company that sells a $3 product 
um, where they have, you know, 50,000 customers and five customer success folks or five salespeople that are responsible for, you know, renewals or upsells. It's impossible for those five, you know, folks to manage 10,000 relationships each. Uh, but if there's data collected around how those people are viewing content, how those people are uh, interacting with the website, how those people are attending webinars, how many times those people are adding things to their cart or calling into the support line. And all of that information is readily available to the customer success individual or the account manager or the salesperson. What they can then do is start to prioritize and realize where the low hanging fruit is, where the at risk customer base is, where they should be spending their time and how can they, how they can use that customer base's interactions with your content through that marketing automation platform to um, you know yield the best results so you know if I were to run a report uh, in our CRM of people that have been on the website that have downloaded a case study I can see that those people are more likely to be engaged with you know what I'm putting out there on the web and if I were to reach out to them the likelihood of, res a, likelihood of a response would go up so I if I can hear you understand you correctly you're not so much speaking about uh, demographic segmentation or analytics you're focusing more about the customer's behavior. And I also like how you go beyond just a digital dashboard of metrics, but in terms of recommendations, and I know a lot of AI tools out there, that's where they're proceeding is not just providing results, but providing recommendations, calls to action, to-do lists, etc., for the uh, operator to follow up on. And you mentioned a, a couple of those so other than the ones that you mentioned in the services side of things and, and communicating through emails, is there any other kinds of uh, tools out there that you see that can really provide those recommendations? Yeah, there are a ton of really cool tools. Um, you know, one of the companies that sits next to us in the startup accelerator that we're in here in Toronto is a company called nudge.ai and they're not the only one but they're a cool one for because you know what they do is um, you know offer you insights to better understand how to reach out to the people that you want to reach out to you know things that they may have mentioned in social articles things that they may have um, you know tweeted about things that they uh, care about the tone of the LinkedIn profile that they've created for themselves, whether they're conscientious or authoritative, and how you would structure your language or your email to likely to, to or your your phone call to get the best response or the highest level of engagement for those people. So those tools are really coming about. Some other ones that I really like are tools like Crystal Nose, which is a, a almost like a like a like a fortune teller in, in that same aspect. Um, but you know, automation tools are coming up uh, all over the place that basically are allowing businesses and consumers to better anticipate or understand how the individual they are reaching out to or engaging with is going to respond. And I think that's what, that's, that's something um, really great uh, in that it, it's going to allow businesses to be able to make more informed decisions on the micro or individual rep level, which, you know, if you look at big data analytics tools, uh, pre you know, historically the, um, the decisions that were made with those tools were more macro and down to the um, the company level. But if we're able to empower each individual user or each individual employee or team member at the company with those, you know, pieces of information in real time, I think it's gonna it's gonna allow companies to move a lot faster. And that gets back to that relationship side. If we know what is a success metrics or what wins for the customer, we can try and tailor a solution around that. But I imagine the competitors are, are using similar tools and they're able to tailor their story or their offering to what it is that aligns or resonates with the customer. So assuming that we're now at the state of the art in which everyone has these kinds of tools where they can really resonate with the customer, what's beyond that? I mean, what's what are we going to see as the next level of selling on the services side when every cost, every company can resonate with the customer on a micro level. I mean, what will be version 2.0 kind of thing? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, as we move down this path of technology kind of becoming integrated with our lives, uh, 
the actual technology and the product is almost becoming table stakes at this point. And I think, especially in selling services, the biggest competitive differentiator that you can build is the strength of your team and the sales process and the knowledge and empathy and reciprocity and humanity that your team builds into the way that they you know, handle every interaction. Because at the end of the day, you know, if you're selling a service, um, your sales process is, in essence, the demo of the service that you're going to provide once they do sign on as a customer. So, you know, we do heavy training on our side to make sure that, you know, objections are handled politely, the language structure is used in, a, in an empathetic way, that there's always curiosity at play, that the tone of voice and the energy levels are high, that the quality of the emails is impeccable throughout the entire sales process, that, you know, when they get the handoff, that there's an immediate, you know, interaction from the customer success team so that they feel welcome and like, um, like they're part of a, of a family. And I think that's where service companies can differentiate themselves going forward as technology becomes table stakes. Earlier, I had talked about uh, services and on the risk side for customer, and you've brought in the dimension of empathy. And you talked about how to show empathy during the sales process itself. How can we demonstrate empathy prior to the sales process? We could have testimonials. We could have customer values written, sorry, company values written on the site itself. But how do we get across to the customer that this is a responsive organization issues will be dealt with and we do have compassion and empathy and work towards solutions can we demonstrate that prior to uh you know the start of the sales process the direct interaction yeah i think we can and i think the i'll, I'll revert back to the website as the storefront in telling a story about who the uh who the company is and what the values of the company are and why we're doing what we're doing um, and if it's uh, if it's written or described in a way that tells a story about why this is our passion and why we're solving a problem that we've experienced ourselves we can hopefully have our readers or you know site visitors empathize with the story that we're telling and the way that we viscerally feel empowered to solve this problem um, you know I think a simple way to put it for a small business is, you know, are we going to bed thinking about ways to make this problem easier for the people that we're serving? Uh, and it comes down to the story that you're telling, uh, but it also comes down to the team that you're building and how they talk about you when you're not around. Um, so, you know, it bleeds into your mission, vision, values, into the way that you train, into the way that you talk to your employees, in the way that you train, in, in the way that you encourage them to, you know, give their best, in the, in the way that you uh, encourage them to go seek education and learn and improve. Uh, but also from a, from a from a customer perspective, how you present yourself on your website and your materials uh, to that effect. Ryan, as we come to the end of our podcast here, and we have the both the practitioners and the academic listeners, do you have a takeaway, something that they can action over the next little while? Uh, with relation to what specifically? Uh, sales in the service context. Yeah, I, I think um, one thing that... I see with a lot of small teams, um, and I think I'll stick to that just because that's my area of expertise, um, is in building a sales organization, they often think uh, too deeply into the numbers and forget to, to be human. You know, while all this technology and automation comes into our lives, uh, what we're really doing as salespeople is building relationships. And the more real those relationships are and the, the longer they last, and the more that they kind of bend or cross the line of the sale and enter, um, you know, the real personal type of relationship where I can see myself spending time with that individual, or if I run into them on the street, maybe we, you know, we stop and chat. Um, the stronger the the likelihood of a closed deal will be. So I think, you know, I I, I aspire to coach all of the young salespeople that I come across and all of the small teams that I come across to really build humanity and, uh, you know, just being a real person um, with your prospects. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much for talking about sales service and small team environments. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you very much.